Morning, church. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke 15. Luke chapter 15. So we're in one of the most uh, probably well-known sections of Jesus' teaching ever. One of the most beautiful word pictures. We're going to divide it into three pieces. I'm going to cover two of the parables this morning, and then Anne is going to cover the big piece of it tonight. This whole day is an interesting response to the narrative you have about God. Yesterday we realized that the kingdom of heaven is not a place, it's a person, it's a people. It's wherever God gets what God wants. It's us discovering the treasure that is God, the treasure it, we have when we know that this God, the real God, not the one the world tells us about, not the ones we make in our own image, but the one Jesus revealed. One time his disciples said to him, would you show us the Father? And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen him. We can know who God is. The world does not have to tell us who God is. Jesus did. Now what we're going to learn today is, is quite interesting. You see, yesterday we realized that when we know the king, we know the kingdom, and we know the kingdom, we know the treasure that's available to us. But in today's parables, we're going to realize how we discover it. We don't discover it because we're brilliant. We don't discover God because we had this great quest in our heart. Yes, we discovered him, but only because he pursued us. Now, if I was only given two minutes this morning, this would be the core of what I would want to tell you today. When you read Luke chapter 15, that it is not about you, it is always about him. God pursued you when you were the enemy. God pursued you when you didn't know he was pursuing you. When the world says that God hates you, that if you think a certain way or act a certain way that God hates you, that God is totally out to smoke you, make him mad once, don't do it. That's the world's narrative who doesn't understand the heart of the Father. Yeah, we'll talk tomorrow. God is serious about sin. He, he'll never act like it didn't happen. He cannot in his own character act like we did not rebel. But please understand, even when we were in rebellion, listen to what Jesus says. God came for you. The number one criticism of Jesus, it seems, if you count the number of times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you strung them together over the whole scope, you would find the number one criticism of Jesus is who he hung out with, what kind of people he associated with. They weren't good people. They weren't moral people. But he pursued them. That says in verses 1 and 2, the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the professional believers, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And it says in verse 3, and then Jesus told them a parable. I love that. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he said, let me tell you a story. But before I tell you Jesus' story, I want to tell you my story. I was a young preacher, 23 or 24 years old. I preached on the 23rd Psalm. And basically, let me tell you, I was young. I did the best I could, but I was a city kid. I've never lived in the country. We had a dog. We didn't have animals of any other kind. So I didn't know farm life. And I preached what I thought was a pretty accurate message of the 23rd Psalm. And a man named Carl Nowak, who was 84 years old at the time, he came to me. He put his huge monster hand on my shoulder and he said, youngin, I need you to come to my place tomorrow morning. And I said, oh, okay. What time? He said, when do you get up? And I, I didn't want to tell him the truth because he was a farmer. He probably woke God up. And so I was like, uh, what time do you need me there? He said, I get going about seven. Can you do that? You know, he's kind of mocking me of being a preacher boy. And I said, sure. So I drove out to his farm in a place called Remus, Michigan. I drove out to his farm and he said, hey, drive around the back. You'll see my pickup truck back there. And I drove way back into his acreage back toward this huge barn. And when I opened the door, I almost gagged with the smell. And I said, what are we doing? He said, I want to teach you about sheep. So he took me out to where he kept all of his sheep. The smell was ridiculous. It was overwhelming, funky, gross. And I was like, oh my gosh. And he just smiled. He had the big overalls with the waiters. There I was with my khaki pants and my golf shirt trying to act like an adult. Probably had penny loafers on too. And he just smiled. He took me back to the sheep pen. And he said, let me tell you about sheep. He didn't have to tell me very much because when I saw them, they were gross. See, when I was in Sunday school, every sheep was depicted by a white cotton ball with a raisin for an eye. Are you with me? <laughs> and then I go to a sheep farm. These things had poop stuck on them. 
They were dirty, filthy. He told me they're dumber than a rock. He had a baseball bat that he cut flat-sided. He walked in there and he goes, watch this. And he just paddled one of them in behind with the flat part of the baseball bat. And it was woolen bumper cars for 20 minutes. They ran into each other, ran into the wall, came back out, hit another person. They were all over the place. He, he looked at me and he said, I, I want to show you something. He said, do you think they're, they're aggressive? He said, yeah. He said, there's no other animal in the entire world that fears a sheep. A lamb. Let's call them lambs because sheep sounds weird. He said, there's no animal out there. There's no bunny that sees a lamb and goes, ah. <laughs> they're all like, <laughs> loser. <laughs> they have, they don't, they're not predators toward anything except grass. And so he did something. He took this big fat lamb that was covered in wool and he tipped it over and laid it on its back. And this thing sat there like this for 20 minutes. <laughs> he goes, it can't flip itself over. And I said, no. And he goes, you know what we call that? And I said, no, sir. And he said, that's a downcast sheep. And a passage of scripture clicked in my head. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your trust in God. When a lamb gets flipped upside down, it can't, especially when it's full of wool, it can't get itself over. They don't run very fast because they got little stubby legs. He said, in the 23rd Psalm, it says, he leaves me beside still waters. Do you know why? I said, no. He said, because if a lamb goes by running water, they become scared because if they fall in, imagine you swimming with the wool sweater. He said, they will just sink to the bottom and drown. He leads me to pastures, green pastures. He said, you know, I can't turn my lambs into just any field because they will eat anything. And he said, and what happens is they eat these things called noxious weeds. And I said, what happens then? He goes, well, it's unpleasant. I said, tell me. And he said, they'll eat it and all these gases will build up in their body and their intestines explode. Now, is that awesome or what? <laughs> Could you imagine you're out in the field and all of a sudden, <laughs> Stupid lamb. You know what I learned that day? They're dumb. They smell. They can't protect themselves. They'll eat anything. He said a lamb will put his head down and start eating and end up a mile and a half away and then go, look up and go, huh. <laughs> they don't know where they, they are. They don't know how to get home. They have no sense. Now, when you hear Jesus say, my little lambs, <laughs> does it change the story? Yeah, because we think we're these little white cotton balls with raisin eyeballs. No, we're not that smart. We can't really protect ourselves well. We get flipped upside down and we can't get over. We're scared of things. We're scared of water. We'll eat anything. I know that's true. And then we, poof, gone. You see, when I read the 23rd Psalm, I read it less than it was. A shepherd would know that if a lamb doesn't have a good shepherd, the lamb won't make it. Now, Jesus tells a story. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? We read this poetically and very, very romantically, and we think, of course he does. I'd like to suggest to you that the, the answer to that question is not as easy as we make it. Why would you leave 99 to go pursue the one? That's a risk. That doesn't make sense. It's better to lose one than 99. If you chase the one and the 99 scatter or an animal comes in and attacks them and you're not there to protect them, you're really risking one over the 99. I think that's his point. That a good shepherd cares about every single one. The world's telling you that's not our God. I want you to see that it is. Every single one of us is known and is loved. The world will say, no, no, if you have certain appetites, if you've done certain things and God's just one second away from being ticked, I want to redeem the name of our God. God takes sin seriously. He takes you more seriously. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Mr. Nowak told me that if a lamb runs away more than twice, he will break its leg. Now, I know some of you are out there, that's cruel. It isn't actually. It beats dying. Because if a lamb runs away, it can't protect itself. It could get itself in trouble. Have you seen the YouTube clip of the hundreds of lambs following each other over a cliff? If you haven't, when we're done here sometime today in your free time, Google it. It's worth a giggle. The best part is after about the 400th lamb goes over, they start landing on each other like mattresses and they survive. The first few, not so much. They're that dumb. 
But he says here, when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it home. He's probably disciplined it by breaking its legs so it can't get away from its safety. Do you think maybe every now and then God might allow something to happen in our lives, not to hurt us, but actually to protect us, and in that we find discomfort? He calls his friends and neighbors together and he says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Verse 7 is so crucial. I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Read verse 7 slowly and carefully. Jesus is addressing a group of people that questioned who he hung out with. And he says, I rejoice over the one who knows they need to change their life than the 99 who are sitting here thinking they don't have to. It's kind of a dig on the religious people. See, Jesus said, I came as a physician to heal the sick, not to care for those who think they're healthy. And I came as a shepherd to pursue the lamb that needs me, not the ones who don't think they do. He tells another story, verse 8. Or suppose a woman has seven, or ten silver coins and loses one. I want to pause here and give you something in context. In Jesus' day... A woman could not go out and get a job, a profession. Now, she might make things at home and sell them in the market. She might raise chickens and eggs and stuff like that. She might do that. But it really, she took care of the house. She did what in his culture. So when he says a woman has 10 silver coins, there's very little opportunity for her to have an 11th. Are you with me? So 10 is what she has. And he says if she loses one coin, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Let me put this in your context, something you would understand. Should a young lady at MOVE lose her cell phone, won't she turn the campus upside down to find it? And the people said, of course she would. This is Jesus' audience. And when she finds it, I think it's funny, she calls her friends. (laughs) That was accidental. And her neighbors, and together, she says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Verse 10 is as important as verse 7. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's two key themes in these two stories. Repentance and joy. Repentance and celebration. The world says your God is stuffy. The world says your God doesn't allow you to have fun. The world says that God will never ever party. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus said, you haven't met my father. When you realize who you are by realizing who he is and you come back to his goodness, it brings God joy. Don't let the world tell you God's against celebrations. He's the only one who really knows what to celebrate. And do you know what he celebrates? You. Now, let's get this straight. You're not the most important person in his kingdom, but you're as important as anybody else. Did you catch that? None of us are more valuable than another, but every one of us has a special place in God's eyes as he looks to us as we return home. We repent, it brings him joy, and there's celebration around God when one person returns. Last thing I want to point out this morning, so you understand God. The lambs got lost because they were ignorant. The coin got lost because somebody misplaced it. I'd like to make one last application because I think it fits the room today. Some of you are coins. Somebody did something horrible to you and you feel devalued. They lied to you. They broke a promise. Some of you have gone through something so unfortunate that somebody used you, somebody touched you, somebody harmed you. And you think you're never going to be whole again. And you think you're worthless. And you think that 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 was taken, much was taken from you. But I need you to understand this. God of heaven is going to fix everything that's broken in every one of us. Even if it was done to us. Are you with me church? That's our God. He's not in heaven disconnected. He's not going, oh, that's a shame. No, our God grieves with us. Our God understands what we're going through. Jesus knows the pain the world can inflict. Some of us are coins, and I'm here to tell you, Jesus will turn the world upside down to bring you back to him. Some of you are lambs. You don't know how you got in the situation you got in. I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm saying you're ignorant. There's a subtle difference. Call it naive. You trusted somebody and you ended up And one night you looked at yourself in the middle of a party and you went, how how did I get here? 
It wasn't as much intentional rebellion. You just didn't know. You did what came impulsively, instinctively to you, which is take care of yourself. So you did some things. You said some things. And all of a sudden you found out, I'm not having, there's no joy in my life. There's no satisfaction. I'm empty. And you're wondering what's happening. Listen to Jesus. He said, I came to bring you back. I'm going to carry you home. To the coin, he said, I'm going to search the world for you. You see, we didn't find Jesus. You guys, he found us. The greatest privilege in life is that the king of glory would come to earth. You know, there's a, there's a line in a song, and I'm not going to mock it, but I want to fix it. You know, he didn't want heaven without us. Yeah and no. You see, what he didn't want is you to miss out on the opportunity that the kingdom of God is bringing you. So he brought heaven here that we might taste it together. And one day when he recreates the heaven and earth and he puts it all together and we rejoice with him. You want to talk about a party? We are going to celebrate like we've never celebrated anything. I'm a Cub fan. 2016 was the miracle of all miracles. And I can tell you where I was sitting. I can tell you the emotions of my son Alex on the floor in his spot he always goes to in Cub and Notre Dame games when it gets tough. So no one can see him. Braden's sitting on the couch to my left. I'm sitting in my chair. And when the final out, and if you don't care about this, repent. <laughs> and when the final out was made in that World Series and Chris Bryant threw the ball to Anthony Rizzo and he picked up the ball, we all looked at each other and went, oh my gosh, it happened. And it is a moment indelibly in my life because since 1974, I have died with that team more than I've ever celebrated. But that was such a taste of waiting patiently for something good to happen it's just baseball right God gives us celebrations every day and I need you to know this you are so important to why he came that if this week you turn your heart toward home you're going to bring God joy you're going to know God deeper and the kingdom of heaven is going to burst out into your life that's why Jesus came to find us to restore our value to bring us home. Please pray with me. Jesus, we celebrate your celebration of us. How can you be so good to us? How, when we told you to leave us alone, would you come here anyway? When we told you that we don't need you, why would you give your life for us? But you did. Because your love is so overpowering that you see our value when we don't. Father, for those coins in the room that have been lost by the choice of another person? Would you bring healing and hope and life to their hearts? Would you tell them the truths that their minds won't even permit? Would you stop the voices in our lives that tell us who you are and it's just not true? To the sheep, Father, thank you for putting up with our naivete, for, for pursuing us when we keep running away. Jesus, most of all, thank you that you show us the Father. You show us his glory. And in some strange way, you invite us into it. We are blessed. You are good. We are loved. And we are thankful. And we pray this, not because of ourselves, but by the powerful name of the Lord Almighty, Jesus Christ. And the people said, Amen. Amen.